What's it gonna take for you to finally break up with your bullshit? Think what you could do if you could only break up with your bullshit. Oh. Hello, my name is Michelle Aiken. Welcome to the Break Up With Your Bullshit podcast, where I bring on brilliant creative minds who have achieved super cool things in the world and talk to them about how they broke up with their own bullshit and were able to get their work out into the world and to keep going past rejections, etc., cetera, et cetera. I have a guest today that's a very good friend of mine that I basically insisted on becoming friends with because I was so obsessed with her fan fiction writing only to discover that she is a prolific writer outside of the fan fiction world and has actually written an award-winning musical and lived near me and we got to start hanging out in real life. That's right. It's not always creepy to, uh, to you know, force someone to become your friend through Tumblr chat and then, uh, you know, see them in real life. So we'll talk about her in a mo, but, uh, I want to start by saying that I, I'm still reeling from the live event. We had over 50 people, um, on the event and, uh, I'm just still getting lots of messages from people about what they got from it. And I'm seeing in the Facebook group, one of our speakers visa challenged people to do a 100 day challenge and a whole bunch of people took it on. And it's basically just doing something 100 times. And so there's people making videos. Uh, Dustin is doing this thing of, um, going on TikTok and whatever the first sound, uh, that he hears making a, a dance, a choreographed dance to that sound. That's really cool. Cressy's making, just pra- practicing being on camera and speaking every day. Um, Marcus is doing a drawing every day. Uh, there's so many different cool things going on and lots of energy over there. So if you're not in the Facebook group, check it out. I'll make sure that there's a link. But if you go to my Instagram and you click that tap link in my bio, it's got everything that, everything I talk about is always in that tap link. So when all else fails, go there. The other thing is that I launched this, well, it hasn't begun yet, but I started taking applicants and, um, and registrants for bullshit rehab, which is a six week program that is designed to have you really get in deep around what is stopping you and have a totally different level of support around it. There's a lot of this stuff you can DIY. And if you're, if that's not working or it's not working for what you actually want, I created, I did it for you basically so that you just get into this process and we're going to, um, unearth a lot of stuff. There's going to be tons of feedback on people's projects and just where you are and being able to bounce things off of other people. Um, weekly audio recordings, weekly circle meetings, we're calling them circle, uh, where we'll get, everyone will get together and get supported around wherever they're stuck. And, uh, and there's more also anyone who signs up for bullshit rehab is going to have a lifetime VIB pass to all future break up with your bullshit live events. So if that's something that you are interested in, you can go to bullshitrehab.com and apply and we'll reach out. And, uh, if you're, if you went to the live event, you should have an email from me about, uh, a, a secret backdoor. You get to skip the application process and just come straight to me. So, uh, so check that out and do, do, think that's it. I think that's it. Um, so I hope to see y'all in the Facebook group. And even if you weren't at the live event, you could take on the 100 days challenge. I'd be happy to, uh, actually visa is in the Facebook group. So I could ask him to reiterate the challenge for people at some point so that you can see what he says, but it's basically what I just said. So, uh, so do that. All right. So my interview today, like I said, uh, so the writer that I really admire, her name is Julie Soto. And, uh, and I knew her before I knew her as Julie, I knew her as loves Bitka eight, which is her pen name. She is beloved by many people in the fan fiction world. There's a whole Facebook group just to be a fan of her. Um, and there's people all over the world reading her stories, translating her stories into their language so that people who only speak their language can enjoy them. Um, I recall that in the height of a few of her recent stories, people were asking, what time will the new chapter be posted? And it's like 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern. And for them, that's 4 a.m. And so they're setting an alarm so they can wake up at 4 a.m. and read the chapter the second that it comes out. So there's that kind of like mania basically. And I'm one of those people, (laughs) but I'm on the East coast. So 
Tech, uh, thankfully, I, w- I was still uh, usually awake when these things happen, but I, I have woken up many a Monday morning to the notification in my inbox and just stopped everything I was doing for an hour to read one of her fix. So it defies that whole I don't have time thing because you just get so wrapped up in her writing that you can't possibly put it down. Um, yes, yeah, sh- and, and I'd say this in the thing in the interview, but truly I don't think I would have started writing if it wasn't for Julie and her her fix because when I once I started reading hers and I felt like it was the genre I wanted to write in the the romantic comedy and I could see it as a movie that's what really inspired me to start writing myself so I owe I owe her a lot and um she's got a really cool story other than the fan fiction stuff. And we start and we talk most, we talk about that for the whole first half of this. And there's a lot of her story that I didn't even know, even though we've been friends for a while. So it was super interesting for me. And you'll be able to tell because I'm mostly saying, wow, wow, the whole time. (laughs) But if you've ever wondered what it takes to put up a musical, uh, you're going to find out. So it's pretty interesting and, um, and inspiring. So without further ado, here's my interview with Julie Soto. So I always wear a shirt that in some way relates to whoever I have, if I can think of something. And I almost didn't think of this shirt. You've seen this, right? I think so. You might have worn it like at that bar that one time. (laughs) Oh, yes. At that bar that one time. Um, For those who are not watching on YouTube, it says, ask me about my shift. And I will, I will say, I don't wear this out anywhere, Julie, because I don't want random strangers saying, oh, what's your ship? Or what does that mean? Because yeah. then I got to lift my shirt up. Yep. <laughs> show them that it's Hermione Granger and Draco Malfoy. I don't want to show that to, to a person that I'm standing in front of at a store. The internet's fine. The internet's great, but <laughs> heaven forbid someone face-to-face with us knows anything (laughs) and that's the nature of fan fiction (laughs) hey nice segue nice segue okay so um thanks for being here first of all hello thank you for having me truly my pleasure i've been looking forward to this um so i always start out with how do we know each other Mm -hmm. you tell it honey well michelle is really good at getting what she wants (laughs) I like this already. I'm glad I asked you. (laughs) That's one thing that I will always say about Michelle is she will get what she wants. And I flatter myself by saying she wanted to be my friend. (laughs) (laughs) So she basically, uh, I write fan fiction for Harry Potter and uh, Draco and Hermione specifically. And she read it. Um, and reached out to me on Tumblr. And the fun thing, um, if I may make myself sound as arrogant as possible, um, is that I get a lot of people reaching out to me on Tumblr um, and on different platforms. And, you know, I have, I wouldn't call it generic responses at all, but like very much like, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for reaching out. Um, And Michelle had such nice, lovely things to say, but continued to chat with me in ways that were not, I am your biggest fan. (laughs) Um, And I wouldn't say to dehumanize fan people, but like she was very human with me. Um, And we were chatting and I had no idea who she was. I never watched Grace and Michelle. (laughs) And I don't know what it was that you were specifically trying to show me maybe you do but you I think you were trying to either maybe show me something on YouTube or well I did a video with Grace where I mentioned you that's probably what it was so you mentioned me and you just said hey I mentioned you in this in this video just in case you wanted to watch it and suddenly I was like millions of subscribers (laughs) (laughs) And, and again, not to diminish um, fans and people who reach out, but I was like, Michelle's a person. <laughs> I use that so, so out. 
Yeah, no, she did. And, and I was, and like our conversation shifted from there. Like we started talking as creators together. We started miniature collaborations. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, you know, that one fic that we wrote. Now this is magical y'all because- it's magic. I might've had it on a vision board of sorts. I don't really make vision boards, but I make them in my head um, to write, to co-author something with you and also with Senlin Yu, who is yeah. another of the uh, big Dramione writers with huge mm -hmm. followings. Um, and then it, I just sort of forced it to happen one day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, but it was barely that, like, I feel like Sin kicked us off. Like we started writing a co-writing a fic on tumblr like we would just post like 200 words underneath each other and then Blog. until it was done yeah yeah um and, and like called, i think it might because yeah. you thought that it might be senlin news birthday or she thought that it might be your birthday the funny thing was i thought it was her birthday oh, okay but my birthday was actually the next day so by the time we had finished it it, it was, was my birthday it was very odd it was a and it was never Sen's birthday. <laughs> no, it was her fan fiction anniversary or something. Yeah. And, and so she puts that on her like Facebook profile as her birthday. Right. Yeah. All right. I guess, I guess it's Senlin Yu's birthday. So it's yeah. not actually it's you true. Know, her name. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah. That, that fic is, um, is actually really good. And <laughs> I've, I've gone back, I've gotten comments on it. I've seen comments recently on it. And I'm, every time that one of those comes in, I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. our silly crack fic that we live wrote there's nothing like live writing a fic yeah I, I, I would I, I don't I don't do it often yeah but we should do it more because how fun yeah a lot less like fact checking and like caring about accuracy or tone <laughs> yeah timelines <laughs> Any, anyone who's written fan fiction and you start opening up a calendar to be like, okay, the Battle of Hogwarts, 1998, what day? Okay. May 1st the birthday to was, the 2nd. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the 5th of June. So we don't want to step over that. And then Hermione is yeah. sold by September 27th, 30th. Wait, what is it? Wiki. Yeah. Harry Potter wiki. Yeah. Yeah. Like the constant flow. Yeah. In the same way that like authors of original fiction have to like google like how long it takes to kill someone by poison um you know we have to know uh the exact placement of the dark mark and <laughs> yeah, because heaven forbid we post something and there be an inaccuracy that someone starts pointing out in the comments exactly yeah that's just, precisely I had someone it. point one out in my sour grapes fic from years ago and they said it on wattpad recently and i was <laughs> like i just responded this fic has been up for years and you're the first person to notice this inaccuracy so i'm not even mad thank you <laughs> i'm not even and mad about it i'm not going to change it because no one notices it so yeah uh, i don't even remember what it is now so that'll just be <laughs> crazy if you read my fix i know that my friend m who edits it is, is like what is it tell me just think of that right <laughs> now um so so i have some questions from uh from people in the break up with your bullshit group but mm -hmm. i also would love to just first um Talk about your life outside of fan fiction a little bit and, um, you know, your life as a writer. Like, yeah. I, and there's stuff that I actually don't know because I know that you've like won awards and stuff like that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so take me back. When did you really start writing? I was born on a warm summer's <laughs> day. Um, <laughs> I. I've always wanted to write, but I've, I was always an actress first. So that was kind of the outlet that I was using creative creatively for a while and putting all the energy into. Um, but I started to do playwriting before I started doing fiction writing. Um, so I was like doing some like script doctor work and, um, like writing original, original uh, books, uh, scripts. Um, and then I, I was also co-running a theater company, a children's theater company in Sacramento. Wow. And we were trying to think of a show to do with our teenagers um, because Beauty and the Beast didn't have enough female characters. 
And uh, I think Shrek was the other option. And we were like, come on. <laughs> um, which amazing shows, like clearly. Yeah. But we were, our kids had been doing like, 13 and like playing actual teenagers for so long and like we'd just done like a, a few years before that we did Peter Pan with flying like we were like we were getting more and more professional um mm-hmm. and so for them to go back to playing you know a, a candelabra um yeah. was was Up number two it's yeah exactly yeah uh silly girl number two was Mm. is my favorite role because they're just called the silly girls um the three girls that go after Gaston oh yeah um (laughs) but uh they so like I was drunk one night with the other runners of the company and I said I'll write you a better musical than Shrek we're not doing Shrek (laughs) (laughs) drunk declaration Yeah. yeah and I called my friend and executive producer on the way home. Um, I wasn't driving, <laughs> uh, but myself. Just that night, story detail. It's just going to blow past that. And I said, "Okay, wait. I have an idea." <laughs> and it was like within within hours of declaring, I could write you a musical, um, and contracted. A friend of mine who plays, uh, who who writes some music and plays piano, um, who works with us often, and um, we just started developing this musical. Uh, it's called Generation Me, um, and it's an all teen musical. It's very important to us to always have young people instead of twenty eight year olds playing fifteen. Uh, which is clearly very common on Broadway for so right. many reasons, but it is not it's closer to spring awakening than it is Greece in terms of like how much you would want an actual 15 year old expressing those emotions. Mm -hmm. Um, And we had an entire, we had like a 21 person cast when we started and uh, I named every single character. They had, all of them had backstory. All of them had issues. No one will be silly girl. Everyone. Will no, be silly girl. no one will be silly girl. Number two. Awesome. I, I refuse. Um, and so we, we created, we created this plot. We created the score. We did all of the work in like four months and put it up. And at the end of it, we knew we had something good. Um, and just kept working it, kept working it. We've gone through like three different casts. We've like gone through seven to 24 different versions of the script. Um, And uh, so basically we took it to Hollywood for the Hollywood Fringe Festival and New York for the New York Fringe Festival got a lot of good reception, got just a lot of great experiences having like, not just like the kids, high school friends and their parents come to see the show, but to get feedback from strangers and um, people who come in off the street Um, and other like festival people. Cause that's a good thing about the festival culture in um, theater is that like, I'm putting my show up at this festival and hoping strangers come in. Let me see what's happening next door. Right. Um, and so we had like a lot of good feedback and praise. And um, one of my favorite stories that I love to tell is that we started hearing, we started like looking into what the New York Musical Festival was. And that is uh, NYMF. They tried, to, they tried to tell you not to pronounce it nymph, but that's what we all do. Um, yeah, exactly. They like tried to rebrand like four years ago. And I was like, I can't. <laughs> it's nymph. Um, <laughs> we're all nymphos yeah so (laughs) we we, um we basically you know i heard about this festival it was very elite um had like um do you know altar boys you would love altar boys it's like a i know christian boy band musical of like you're at you're at a concert for a christian boy band like we're here to rock the jesus into you and like you know and it's just such (laughs) It is such a wild ride because they basically sing an album at you. And it's like the same structure as a Backstreet Boys album where it's like, we start big, we have another big one. We mellow it down for the Nick Carter solo. You know, like like it's the exact ebb and flow of a Backstreet Boys That's album. Um, 
and like each each cast member has their own song and it's great um so and their names are uh matthew mark luke and juan uh and abraham he's jewish so there, it's just a it's a wild ride anyways altar boys started at nymph um and so it was off broadway they've been like a couple other shows that like went from nymph to off broadway and like got the exposure there and um so I just knew there's something about Nymph that I knew in my heart was the next right step. And so we, we applied the first year and didn't get in. And I was really upset about that because I yeah. thought we were doing well. Um, we applied the second year and didn't get in. And I was like, okay. okay. <laughs> and wow. it became this like chorus of us being like, fuck nymph, you know, like <laughs> of like whenever something that, you know, in the same way that people say, thanks Obama, yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. this, that was us too. It's like, <laughs> this is nymph's fault. Um, but like, the thing is we were also like remounting the show and rewriting the script all the time. And like, we kept recording the demos in different ways. And like, so we had all this material and all this Actually, great work. The, the school that you were writing it for, they they did it. Yeah, the, the it was a theater company that I was, that oh, I was running. Oh, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So we we had like a built in workshop cast essentially. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and so we took a year off. Like we didn't apply for the 2016 nymph and the 2017 nymph. I was like, let's just try it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> and it was third time's a charm. Wow. And and it was just like to the point where like they they narrow it down to the top 20 and then they narrow and then the top 10 actually go. And of course like you know, it still costs $100,000 to put a show on out there. Wow. Um because they're not giving everything to you for free. You can do things very very cheaply but you have like to go you get money. Yeah. And you have to pay the cast. You have to, there's New York labor laws, you know, it's, um, that's a lot of businessy stuff. Like, and I realized I don't like that. Yeah. I don't think a lot of creatives listening, like also I just paused for a second because everyone listening, raise your hand. If you would have stopped after two tries for sure. I definitely would have stopped after two. I'm like, fuck that festival. I never want to fuck that festival. That was exactly it. I was like, whatever you think that we're just like a high school musical you yeah. know it's like they probably don't even listen to it um whereas in actuality you have no idea why you didn't get chosen exactly you have no idea you can make up all kinds of stuff and be completely incorrect yeah and of course the script was getting stronger you of know course, like of yeah. course the work was Time. getting stronger um but so by the time they like when there's the top 20 someone from the festival calls you, ca- calls the creative team and does a little interview and just kind of like, make sure you're not all crazy. Mm-hmm. And like, also make sure that you think you can get this much money together, you yeah. know? And like, uh, here's resources for this. Here's this, that, and the other. What do you think? Um, and I told her on the phone, um, I was like, I just want to say whether or not we get in, you know, like I was doing the full thing. I just want to say that like we, this is our third time applying and I'm so honored to be at this point. And, you know, and it was, just, it, it was so true. I wasn't even trying to kiss yeah. ass at that point. I was just like, I'm so glad to be talking to someone from the festival who says, this is really good. I don't know if it's going to be right, but it's good. You know, I, I like it and I think it has legs. Yeah. Um, I got chills twice when you were just explaining that because I, I really yeah. I can tell it's it goes a long way to just be honest and open and you don't have to play it so cool. I, I find a lot of people think that they have to put on this really cool front yeah. in order to something and it's just not not the case at all. Yeah. If you can say from a very genuine place, if you can suck up to someone from a very genuine place, yes. it, that's when it will work and it's yeah. not sucking up. Yeah. Um, and we ended up getting in and it was like such an incredible, like the cast we had at that time included uh, Milo Mannheim, who is now a Disney Channel star. Wow. And like his movie was like just coming out. <laughs> so we were like, this is insane. We're going to have like a celebrity kid in our show yeah um and a couple other other people um 
we had Dante um, Palmieri, uh, Chaz, Palm, am I saying Palmieri, Palmentary? They're going to kill me. Um, Chaz <laughs> Palmentary's kid, um, Chaz, who's the uh, a Bronx tale and al- always plays like the mobster guy in yeah. movies. So we had his son in it too. And we were able to just get this all-star cast. Um, and it was just crazy to go out and do it and like apparently i know i'm getting into this and not like doing the full question that you asked but the (laughs) the kit when we 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 opened and it was an amazing opening night and suddenly like the festival staff was like where can i watch this from backstage because there are no more tickets (gasps) and everyone at the festival just said i need to see this show and I'm working every single night except for this night. Like, where can I stand in the tech booth? Yeah. Wow. And, and you know, like, such a great feeling. Like, like I'm already, like, dreaming of Broadway, of course. But just in general, the, the, the people who are used to watching 10 to 20 uh, semi-professional productions a summer, um, you know, really want to see this one. Amazing. And, um, the most fortunate thing out of all of that was that we hired producers who there are certain Broadway producers and off-Broadway producers who like the festival circuit because there's a hustle, there's a little bit of money and like, it's just a hustle for them. Yeah. And, and like we hired um, these two guys who are our age, um, who there are more our managers, not our producers, but they basically said, we will not be raising your money, but we will spend it for you. Uh, Tell you, (laughs) which, you know, which for me, exactly. Which for me also, like, I'm like, I don't want to deal with equity contracts. I don't want to know to, yeah, exactly. I don't want to know what the union regulations are for this, that, and the other. Like, I don't want to know what fireproofing I need to do for these set pieces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and they'd wow, done this is like, like all stuff I've obviously never in my life and neither had you. Right? <sighs> I mean, I was running a theater company, so I knew some basic crap. Mm-hmm. Like I was a lighting designer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I had like, I, you know, I was really interested in meeting our lighting designer and he and I like hit it off. Great. Yeah. Um, and so our two producers um, never stopped by our rehearsal like never had time. They were, or I should say managers. Two managers were like running two other shows at Nymph and like their casts were falling apart. They had actors quitting. You know, there was like such drama yeah, and we drama. were like, we were like, we need you for this, this and this. And like, let us know what you need from us. <laughs> and um, they finally got to see it at the final performance. And they said, we'd like to sit down with you <laughs> do you guys have a second before we go off and celebrate? And the three of us, um, my composer, I did book and lyrics. Mm-hmm. And then our director, who also contributed a lot to the story and development, we sat down with the two of them and they were like, this show has legs. Mm-hmm. We want to help you push it forward and start talking about um, optioning the show and, and starting to be your producers for it i know i I'll, I'll just keep getting chills as you're telling this is bringing back like joy like i ha- it's one of those projects that like you lose so much joy for over the years yeah and then like when you like are Re-tell. able to talk about the joy again yeah um yeah and so that was amazing we it, the festival lasts like six weeks and um maybe it was less but it basically like your show takes place in one week Mm. So you like tech in on a Tuesday, you either open Tuesday night or Wednesday night, and then you have four more shows before Sunday. Wow. End of, end of thing. Um, which also makes it hard when people say you have to see this show. And then there's only like two more performances. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we waited like three more weeks for the, uh, for the award ceremony. And we weren't, you know, we, we felt the buzz. We heard, you know, like Pete, the staff members said they wanted to see it. And 
you know, all that stuff, but we attended the award ceremony. I got very drunk. Um, and, <laughs> and then suddenly my name was being called often. <laughs> we won eight awards that <gasps> night. And, and that's the most awards that any show has ever won from the New York Musical Festival Awards ceremony. Wow. And I won best book. Oh, and yes. we won best overall production. Huh. And after three tries of not getting in, yeah. two tries and, you know, third time's a charm. And then we won the entire festival. Like <laughs> that's, I know that's, that's the story that I want anyone here to remember. Um, <laughs> Keep freaking going. And whoever yeah. says no to you, they don't know. See anything. if they'll, you yeah. Know, like, ask again. Ask again. So maybe they'll say yes next year. Yeah. As long as that's like, okay, like don't like badger people. Yeah. Which is another thing I'm learning now that I'm looking at publishing. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> don't badger people. <laughs> mm. Like in what sense? Like, uh, you know, there, there are the do's and don'ts of any little industry, you know, like don't, don't be that person. Don't pick up the phone to call, you know, people anymore. You just, the, the little do's and don'ts you're not supposed to to, you're supposed to follow and with publishing it's like everyone is four months behind <laughs> if it's been four weeks don't waste your time and theirs by sending a nudge phone. yeah oh. don't like nudge yeah. them for information like you're just annoying everyone's doing it yeah 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 and you know that's fine I there's also just the fear of like I have, what I have to offer you is already in your hands. And if I remind you that I'm annoying, then that, <laughs> that could be put in the, the way trash. That read it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so essentially we won the festival. Um, it was amazing. We started talking more with the producers. We like officially signed with them. We've done a couple more workshops and now COVID. So we were just kind of gearing up to one more production. Um, but uh we still have interest in a lot of um, companies. Our, our final end goal is still off Broadway. Um, I just think it suits off Broadway more than Broadway, Broadway. Um, but, you know, of course, if someone's like, I want to put it on Broadway, here's $17 million. Well, we will be have, like, <laughs> there's a lot of really successful off Broadway productions. And, and yeah. uh, until you just said it, I never really thought of off Broadway as a goal. Cause you always think that, no, no, people are, you're just shooting for Broadway, but it's sort of like an indie scene and it's yeah smaller theaters and more intimate crowds and more niche -y and, yeah. uh, and something could really die on Broadway real quick. Yeah. Well, you put so much money into something and then if it's not selling, then apparently it's a failure. Like Immediately. <laughs> Immediately. Yeah. Like yeah. on stage, I I've auditioned for, I've auditioned for a few Broadway shows, but the one, the one that I like, I, I had uh, a few callbacks for it closed after three months and I was like, man, it would have been cool to be in that show, but I'm also like really glad I didn't get cast. Cause what a, what a freaking heartbreak that would yeah. to do yeah. it for three months and then not get to do it anymore. I know. I, I saw, um, Alanis Morissette's musical. I mean, it's, mm. it's her music, but it's not right. her musical. Um, Jagged Little Pill. I saw it right before COVID hit. And I was like, ah, oh, I can't wait to tell a bunch more people to see this. Is it really good? <laughs> it was great. It was like, I have some opinions on the script. You know, I, <laughs> I have some educated opinions that I can't, that don't let me enjoy, enjoy things anymore. Uh -huh. But, um, I'm the same way but, my husband and I are like, yeah, no, but it's, it's, it's rough. It's rough yeah. going. Like we pause movies to discuss them in the middle of them and yeah, and have a critique about everything. Yeah. It's ter terrible. Terrible. <laughs> um, but so like our, our end goal is still off Broadway, but, um, it's so funny in the theater world because, you like a lot of industries you only get to shoot your shot once mm. like what you're kind of like what a step is is to do a 29 hour reading which is a special equity contract with for, for actors and stage managers where you only get 29 hours of rehearsal S spread out over a week two weeks but each actor can only be present for 29 hours of rehearsal um is that like and, for some reason it's it's based on the pay 
for that type of project matching the work you are asking the actor to put in uh -huh. because it is a it's essentially a workshop it's in front of microphones with music stands right and presenting to a small audience that include investors and producers. And Which I only know about because of the NBC hit show, Smash. Um, I know about everything I'm talking about because of Smash. <laughs> <laughs> I think we learned about festival culture from season two of Smash <laughs> and like Jeremy Jordan's like storyline oh. and like Catherine McPhee deciding to do the small show with love, Jeremy Jordan. Yeah. I, I want to be in hit list. I want. <laughs> yeah. I just want Jeremy Jordan to come over and record some I just, covers with me. Yeah. Why can't it? Why can't it just be that easy? You know, in, in that show, in uh, the song, Rewrite This Story, when they stand in front of mm. screens and the, uh, I'm like, oh man, I could recreate this. Yeah. Can, mm. But then I also have the thought of wanting to write my own musical. Right. Similar, you know, which is its whole own thing. In, you which, know. you know, we could talk more about that mm -hmm. because... <laughs> Um, I want to do a Slytherin girls musical Aww. like the ladies of Slytherin yeah did you get to see Puffs I did not but oh. I, I know people who were creating it and yeah like because it started at um at the pit at the people's improv yeah like, R.I.P. just yeah close. um but yeah so I but I never actually went in to see it I was in the same building it was in once and I was like oh I gotta see that and I just I never did it, it was hilarious I've heard I yeah, it was such a good, um, not a knockoff, but um, uh, uh, reimagination. It was such a good fan fiction. <laughs> it, it like a fan fiction. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, I, talk, I talked about doing dramatic readings of different fics or like, I don't know. I thought of a lot of different stage show ideas and I yeah. was actually thinking of the pit because the pit was always somewhere I was able to put up a show whenever I wanted. Right. Right. Um, you know, maybe one day that'll all come back. I know. But where were we? I know. Um, 29 hour reading. I was just going right. to say that like you really only get to do one 29 hour reading. Like there can be two little performances of it within like a two day period, you know, but like, like you could do one at Thursday at noon and Friday at noon. So that then like someone can be like, I have a lunch on Thursday. I can't make your thing, you know, because um, <laughs> that's how all of Broadway uh, talks and acts. Um, but <laughs> You, you know, if you put it up, it should be as close to perfect as you want it to be, as it can be, um, because you don't, you're not going to get those same people to come back a year later and sure. say, we've made some adjustments, you know, like it costs so much money. Yeah. And it costs so much money to put it up the first time. It costs right. like probably 50 to 75 grand to put up. A, a two week little workshop just to get right. someone to say, I want to put millions into you. Um, Which, so we're kind I'll, of, I'll just say that I think you have to really love your idea. Yeah. You know, and it sounds like you really did. And it really, even if, uh, you know, it started from some drunk passion, drunk passion. Uh, but from a very genuine place. And, yeah. uh, and then when all of these hurdles come, it's not, well, I guess I can't. It's okay. How do we figure this out? And I think a lot of creatives are like, well, I don't know the business end, so I can't. And it's like, no, no, mm -hmm. no. Idea first, passion first. Yeah. Then you figure it out. Networking. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Get the people in your corner. Yeah. Um, so with Generation Me, we're basically at the stage before 29 hour. We're like, let's do one more work the kinks out thing. So like, Two Novembers ago, November 2019, we did like a, a living room read. Like we rewrote the show with a dramaturg and like helped condense things. Like we cut some characters. We got things really tight and like no one even attended. It was just the producers coming in to be like, I like what you've done. Um, <laughs> but it was for us and we didn't hire anyone to read it. And we kind of all like got on the same page with like, yes, we should put this on its feet somewhere. Um, and so there's a children's theater company in Texas that like is interested. And as soon as they can put teenagers on a stage again, um, Dad. yeah, they, they want to move forward with it. Well, I will be there. Yeah. I will Cause be you're going to drive down I'll drive down from Colorado. Colorado. <laughs> I'll probably get on a plane, honestly. but <laughs> I'll be real close. Uh, but yeah. I would come even if I was still living in Jersey, I, any excuse to go to Texas. Yeah. Um, yeah. but any excuse to go see your show. <laughs> I know. 
Um, so that's the journey of Generation Me. But uh, uh, during this time, I started, you know, I've always, I've read fan fiction since I was a teenager. Um, so like five years ago. And um, I... <laughs> I, uh, and, and I never really wanted to write it. Like I, I would follow certain authors that I'm like, she's so, I, I should say they, cause you never know online, but they, they're so good. They're, they're so like, I would read anything this person would write and, and you, you want to emulate and you want to, you want to try to be a part of their life almost and try to. <laughs> It's good. I sound crazy. I know. Um, no. You're reading and people, you yeah. know, you get into a TV show, you get into a book and you feel like you've been inside of someone else's mind. And so when mm -hmm. you see who created it, yeah. it does feel like you intimately already understand them. Mm -hmm. That's and you want to, you, you want to be around that more too. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is why we're friends. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I really like your story. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'd, I'll just say too that I think when I started reading, I searched archive of our own by number of kudos and yeah. comments, right? Because I'm like, I, I'll trust. I, I, I took chances on a lot of things and I would get into yeah. it and just go, what, what the hell is this? Yeah. Um, and then I, you know, Senlin you popped up and you popped mm -hmm. up. And when I started reading The Right Thing to Do, uh, I that's the title of Julie's fic, uh, of one of a series. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, this is like a rom-com, but Harry Potter, and it's perfect, and it could be a movie, and this is so good that I'm angry. <laughs> like I was getting, I was seething reading it. I'm like, but uh, can I do this? I think I could do this. I'm going to do it. So- <laughs> I, I've said this before, but anytime that I'm stuck um, with my own writing, I just open up one of your fix and start reading and it makes me angry. And then I go um, write my own thing. Angry, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's my support structure for getting inspired. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I wrote quite a few words because of you. <laughs> it, yeah, it's a, it's a, the fan fiction community is a collaboration in its own. Yeah. Like, you know, there's, um, in the same way that like any little, um, niche community, like continues to bolster, like, well, it, like whether it's angry competition or like genuine competitive, um, excitement, you know, yeah, jealous competition, excited competition. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, so I, I like had an idea. I had the idea for the right thing to do. I said, I think like, like, like I started like plotting the whole thing in my head and like, I would be driving to work and I'd use that time to plot and I'd never write anything down because that meant that I was writing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that meant that I'd started writing a fan fiction. <laughs> um, heaven forbid. <laughs> um, and then finally I just started writing it one day and I started posting it um, and I was getting great feedback and, and you like got feedback, like right away. Right. I mean, the thing is I only posted it to like one or two websites that were, um, kind of the more elite websites. Cause I'm always drawn to that. And I'm not ashamed to say it. Uh, but the, <laughs> uh, like the, 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 web, like I did not post it on fanfiction.net right away. I went to, there was a great site called Hawthorne and Vine. Um, and they were like almost curators there. They they betaed your story for you. Like they wouldn't let it go up with wow. typos. Yeah. Like they were the ones who like reminded me that muggle has to be capitalized. <laughs> you know, like little yeah. little things where the, it was kind. It was always kind. They're like, here's our here's our grammar suggestions. And the, and I think wow. it was always like you have to accept 75% of their suggestions in order for them to allow it to post. I had no idea this existed. And unfortunately it went down like oh. after like I posted chapter four. Oh no. <laughs> and so I was like, great. Now I have to, now I have to do the work elsewhere. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, like I had, I had, um, I had a nice little happy little fan base building, you know, people were pleased with it. And I was, you know, when, uh, you know, this with fan fiction writer's block, but like 
there was no such thing as writer's block when you're writing a story for the first time. You could do a chapter Anything. a day. Yeah. yeah, I did that with Sour Grapes. I wrote a yeah. chapter. I you wrote did. times I did two chapters a day. <laughs> full, full, like 2,500 word chapters. They were just like falling out of me. So the idea of doing two chapters a day just made me giggle like that because that is just like it only the most one. ridiculous thing to think one. of at a certain point in your writing. I agree. Like, now, now that I'm over like 350,000 words, I'm like, oh, oh, I know. Oh, how did I do that? I know. Um, yeah, you're like, how long were those chapters? 100 words? Come on. Yeah. yeah um, really. So like things were going well. And then it was really the, the moment that it changed for me was when someone was like, someone recommended this on the Facebook group and I'm so glad they did. And I, that was back when I had time to respond to all comments. And I said, thank you so much. What, what, the, face, what, what is Facebook, the Facebook group? group? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where, where are people singing my praises? You, you told me about the Facebook groups. I didn't know about yeah. them. Yeah. And Facebook is such a huge thing for harry potter fan fiction which is Mm -hmm. so funny um and i joined the facebook groups and i just lurked (laughs) and uh, you know and like i didn't want to like say julie soto is loves bitka eight um because you also like fan fiction is such a history of being like really violent online like doxing and and virtue signaling strangers (laughs) yeah um so it's uh so it basically changed after chapter 24 of the right thing to do um which is the new year's eve ball Uh, um and that's when i saw like every single group talking about it um that's and like sex no that one's valentine's day ball that's i had two balls i love a good ball you know they're both Um, good and the um the gold dress Mm -hmm. valentine's day one the other one is when he subtly offers her wait i don't want to spoil any of this because look (gasps) listen if you're listening to this and you've never read fan fiction you have to read this fic i will disown you you have to read this fic Uh, hear uh, me ming you hear me ming okay um because it's so ming it's so freaking good and actually can we pause here i would love for you to give like a general synopsis of of like the concept of the story Yes. So um, the right thing to do, uh, it's the first in the series. And basically it's the idea that um, Hermione uh, had a little bit of a fascination or crush on Draco at school. And I have so many people who like get up my ass about that. They're like, (laughs) why did that happen though? And I'm like, I don't know. It's a fucking fanfic. <laughs> it's just um, yeah. And it was my first fanfic. So like now if I was writing it now, I'd be like, okay, here's all the flashbacks of why she liked him. Yeah. And um, something happens yeah. that we didn't see in canon. And like, yeah. You know, we make it make sense. Exactly. Um, and it, because I hadn't read fix where Hermione liked Draco first. Usually Draco has like a secret infatuation with her like and can talk her about and, it. Yeah. yeah. He, that's why he bullied her, um, which is my favorite trope. So I don't know why I'm making fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that's what I started with. And the idea that Draco has been uh, in Azkaban for a year following the um, Battle of Hogwarts and that he his trial date has finally been set and Hermione thinks it's the right thing to do to speak at his trial and convince Harry to do the same and say that, you know, he refused to identify us when they brought us to Malfoy Manor. And, you know, just like she, she's able to list off all these reasons why, why she loves him, but essentially why she thinks he's a good person. Mm -hmm. And um, so he's able to be released, but then there also have to be coworkers. So she has to see him everywhere after she <laughs> helps him get out of jail and it just kind of unwinds that way just um putting each other back in their spheres after she has um quote unquote saved him yeah and I, I think one of my favorite elements of your story is that you have Hermione as a ministry worker so she takes a job at the ministry but she also takes this weekend job at a little bookshop that you invented yeah uh, which is canon in my head 
Cornerstone yeah. Bookshop. It's it's not Flourish and Blots. It's this other one off of a side street. And Draco used to yeah. go there as a kid, and so did Hermione, and he saw her there. And there's like all this fun backstory, but like also her working at the front desk and like seeing stories about him in the paper, and then he just walks in. Yeah, one day and she's like, eh. <laughs> and she's like, they have what are words? Answers. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, like the the tension, the awkwardness of the tension. That's the I think the stuff in the bookshop was was the moment when I was like, oh, this could be a movie. This would be such a good movie. Just all yeah. of a little back and forth. And then the really cool thing to look forward to if you read this was that Jules then wrote a follow up from Draco's point of view written in first person, which I really love. I know a lot of people don't like first person fics, but like, I love it. I actually um, hate them. So yeah, it you, was a writing experiment I, for me. I usually hate them too. I, I'm i kind of doing the opposite of what you did now. I wrote Draco Malfoy Gets a Life Coach first person, but mm-hmm. not first person present, first person past. So it's like a little- Right, different. right, right. Yeah. Um, but now I'm writing, I'm like low-key writing another fic now, even though like I'm planning this other thing that we're going to do, but- um, yeah. Uh, I'm writing the fic from Hermione's perspective starting a year prior to when Draco Malfoy gets a life coach starts because there's a whole year that they're or like at least seven months that they're interacting and things are happening that I just skip over and start Draco Malfoy gets a life coach so I'm going back to the beginning now and writing it from her perspective yeah uh, not first person so that I think I could catch more people who Mm -hmm. won't read the first person one and this would be a standalone fic that yeah. grabs people and then they're like, oh, let me go back and read. And and I I'm definitely got that idea from you because you did the, you know, second one from his point of view where we get to find out what the hell was going on in his head the whole time. And it's yeah. so not what you think. And so then you're like, what? This is crazy. <laughs> um, and I'm just telling this for you now. And so then the other <laughs> thing that happened is that in the right thing to do, Draco tells Hermione that if Voldemort had not lost that Mm -hmm. there was going to be an auction at which all of the you know people against Voldemort would have been auctioned off to Death Eaters and Voldemort supporters Mm -hmm. and that Hermione would have gone for this much money and there's a whole thing about it and someone I think someone in the comments said to you oh man that would be how did this how did I would love that story please write that story um (laughs) and I and I was young and naive and I did, what, yes. I did what the fans told me to back then. <laughs> don't, don't do what the fans oh tell God. you to. Um, but essentially, like, I was like, oh, ha, ha, ha. And the, it, was, it was the exact same thing as drunkenly saying I'd write a musical. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I could write no. that dark fic. Oh, my God. Um, and then within a day, I was like, I had, like, the four major plot points done like in my head and so the fun thing about that though is that like I told everyone fine I'll write this fic you want um but I told them that like two years before it started posting yeah so it was like free marketing (laughs) and it was so built up and and but not overhyped I will say because I think I like all of them and I I think I'll always just have a special place for the right thing to do because it was one of the first fics I ever read and you know I think I just love a good rom-com and I typically don't read dark, but uh, yeah. the auction is what it's called. So Jules did the right thing to do. And then a follow-up Draco Malfoy POV called all the wrong things. And mm-hmm. then the auction AU, which stands for alternate universe, right? Yeah. So it's an alternate universe in which um, Voldemort won, Harry is dead. Yeah. And, and it's the same. Yeah. And it's the same backstory as the right thing to do. So when I was saying Hermione had a crush on Draco, you know, for the right thing to do, it's like all of that backstory transfers. The only difference is that at the point of the final battle, Harry died. Right. And so like, then we take off that way. Yeah. And it's wild. And it's, that's, you know, I announced to, I uh, went to your Facebook group, the Jules, the fan Facebook group for you that yeah. I, uh, am planning to write this into a script because of how much I want to see it on screen. And if I can't see it on screen, maybe I could see it on paper meant for a screen. Yeah. Maybe that will satisfy an itch and or yeah. create a good bone structure for something that could one day be turned into something. Yeah. You no. Know, um, I love that moment when you reached out to me, by the way, you were like, Hey, I have an idea for a project and I couldn't wrap my head around it. 
So I needed you to clarify that you didn't want to make a movie. <laughs> <laughs> like I was like, I was like, I, I, I just think you're going to get into so much trouble with this, Michelle. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I, I, what do you need from me? <laughs> and it, it, yeah. But the fun thing is that um, in the fan fiction world, there are plenty of people who uh, uh, are, prof- you know, are from a different country, speak and write in a different language, and they read English fan fictions. Um, and then they ask permission to translate it and give the author credit and that's such a common thing that I told Michelle I was like oh my god it's like you're doing a translation of totally thick into the language of film yes <laughs> yeah and I also after I started looking at actually doing it I decided that I don't know if I would want it as a film because you'd have to cut so much good stuff out right and I couldn't I just couldn't even consider it you know yeah. And so uh, then I had the idea to turn it into a Netflix series because then I could take the right thing to do and make it three seasons and then all the wrong right. things can be two seasons and then we can go to the auction. And yeah. We do that. I mean, I'm talking about the next like three or four years of my life doing this probably <laughs> if I do, you know, do all of them. That's like, this is like the 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 fun thing. Like uh, Topher Grace, when he was in Black Klansman, like in order to keep himself from getting like too deep into the David Duke character he would go home and take the three hobbit films and condense them into one Uh that was what that was his actual project that he was doing to release his brain from david duke and like he he has said this multiple times that he was like how can i take these three films that should have been one (laughs) and he goes through the and edits the scenes together like he just on his laptop doing that and i that being fun yeah but that's also like, I feel like that's what you're talking about. It's not about taking time away from what no. you need to be doing. It's about this release and this need to create. 100%. Yeah, I want to, and I'm scared to start. I'm scared to find out um, that it's too hard or something. And, Michelle, uh, is that your bullshit yeah. talking? <laughs> but the nice thing is that M is still reading through. So until Good. she's done, we can't really start because like we want to be on the same page. Not going to have her read the auction yet because- Mm. Uh, but definitely right thing to do all the wrong things I think she's going back through all the wrong thing or back through right thing to do right now and making notes around like we yeah. what's really funny Jules I'll just tell you this um she messaged me one day and just goes okay so opening shot is Hermione's feet right yeah. like walking down the hall to the you know with her with the shoes and the thing <laughs> you, it's and it's so funny because in your fic the chapter summary starts with Hermione felt the pounding in her ears again. And you, and, and it's at the beginning of every single one. And I listen to your fix. So it always reads it to me. So <laughs> yeah. as I listen, it reads it to me at the beginning of every single chapter. So it's so burned in my brain. And I'm yeah. just like, Oh, how do we get that heartbeat on, on camera? Oh. How do we get that like moment that she's walking, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and how do we show that? And so I, I had it in my head and M typed it out exactly the way it is in my head and sent it to me and I was like ah oh, okay that's oh some gosh. kind of sign that we both saw the exact same vision for how it yeah opened. and we got to do it I, in the meantime I just I stopped writing while I was waiting waiting for her to finish and I got really like disconnected from myself so that's why I started the Hermione POV fic which mm-hmm. um, at first I hated because I didn't make it happen in the past I was making it exactly concurrent with the other story and it was boring it was that- just, like I'm bored. That's exactly what it, it's so funny. So many um, readers want another character's POV of the exact same thing. And I think that is the most boring thing. Yeah. Um, and so when I wrote Draco's point of view to make it not boring, I put it in a different tense, different POV. And journal entry. I, yeah. And, and I also styled it differently, more like journal entries. And I included, and I interspersed flashbacks. Um and like I made everything about it so breathe so differently, but I have to say, like, it is such a pain in the ass to rewrite dialogue from oh, when you know, like, happened. and like you just copy paste and change the change the pronouns, change the I to this, you know, like you 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 start to do it that way, and then you have to actually rewrite everything around the dialogue, and it's Which just you did such a it just slog. I, I I'm, I'm sure. The process of writing all the wrong things, I hated so much. I ended up being 
one of my favorite things I've written, of course, I thought, I thought I did quite a good job with it. Um, but it's, it's really excellent. Like to the point where, uh, I don't know, it feels, it feels like a, um, <clears throat> I don't know if anyone has ever been in a, re- a kind of relationship, like a situation ship with someone where you're like, I don't know if they really like me, but you get to go like look into their brain for yeah. every hour of every day and what they were actually thinking about. It feels like that's really happening to you when you, when you read it. So it feels like this treat to get to read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and you managed to keep it extremely interesting, not just with the flashbacks, but also um, just, just uh, his inner dialogue being so angsty and so yeah. gross. Cause he's a, you know, he's a oh, yeah. boy, a so horny little teenage boy, so like, horny and gross. I love that. That was great. <laughs> People, someone asked, once asked me one time, they said, how do you write teenage boys so well? And I, I wish I remembered exactly what I said, but I basically gave the Jack Nicholson answer from, um, um, the movie, uh, where he's the author, like, how do you write women so well? Like, oh, oh, take oh, away oh. common sense. Like, <laughs> what is that? Wait, um. What is that That's not something's got to give, is it? No, 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 no. Um, it's the one where he has OCD and he like burns his hands with soap. Is and- it that one? Okay, that one is. Um- yeah. I think of a man and then I take, a, I take away all reason and logic. <laughs> That's is pretty much, yeah, yeah. And then he like disappears in the elevator and and yeah. she's like. Uh, as good as it um, gets. Is it, a, okay, yeah. That's what it's called. Yeah. It's, um, name was Googling. <laughs> But I basically gave, I was like, or like someone asked, like, it's so funny how you know when to include dialogue and when to summarize it. And I was like, it's because boys don't listen when you talk. So if I'm in first point of view, first person of his mind, he's not going to pick up all the dialogue. (laughs) (laughs) And it's just great to play, to play with that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what's it like having um so many people reading your shit mm. uh really great <laughs> um you know like um re- it was and i say this with um as much gratitude as i can muster um but the you know the on the climb upward, there's always going to be like that plateau where the amount of engagement is not, the, 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 the quantity is not worth the quality Mm -hmm. at the, anymore. Um, and I, in terms of like the amount of platforms I have to engage on, and it's almost like, it's almost like when um, people go viral or um, or actors make it big and suddenly they can't go outside anymore. Yeah. Like, I think it, I think it becomes that where like, I can't, I can't go on Twitter because I have notifications to respond to. Yeah. And like, and it, and it gets to that. And like, you always want the actors and the people to be grateful. You want the actors to come out the stage door, damn it. Cause I bought a ticket. And like, and that's what I told my friend. I was talking, she's in theater with me. I was talking to her last month and I was like, do you remember how we used to go to the stage door and we used to be so offended when actors like took the secret alley and like, <laughs> like, you know, it's like, why can't they just like come out and wave or like, like what's 30 something. minutes, you know? But like 30 minutes after their three hour performance of Les Mis. That they do every single night. Yeah. And like, they have to get up to go to the gym in the morning or else they won't stay fit for Les Mis, you know, and and it's like the, the training you do, the work you do, the art you create, and then the interaction at the end and something's got, something's got to give. And then you're like, maybe this is as good as it gets. Maybe this is as good as it gets. Um, (laughs) <laughs> it's a Jack Nicholson day. Um, <laughs> so, so it's, it's a, it's a mixed bag of that. Like um, I get like, hello from Brazil. 
sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's insane knowing that there are people so far away um, who are even just learning English yeah. by reading fan fiction. Totally. Um, and, you know, and I, and it's amazing to be reaching this many people. Cause that's, I think what you always want to do as an artist is like, if I can get out of a pocket and get into, into a much larger pocket, that's, that's the driving goal. Yeah. A lot of the time. Um, and it, it just goes back and forth on, um, the good things and the, and the stressful things. Yeah. Yeah. And, of- and thankfully I, you know, I get my fair share of, um, trolls and, um, negative comments and people who, um, give constructive criticism. It's so fun to receive constructive criticism on a fic that has been completed for two years Yeah, and is very popular because the problem with that is yes, they're a minority voice. That doesn't mean they there's less of them. It just means they're the first person to step forward and say, I have a contrary opinion. Um, but constructive criticism on a fic that's finished, what do you want me to do with it? Yeah. I'm not hey, let me go do editing. It. Yeah. <laughs> like there are certain, you know, of course I've learned things like so many people. I don't know why Hermione was in love with Draco, but of course for me, I'm just like, do you know why you're in love with Draco? Yeah. You're reading this shit. <laughs> We're the majority of us identify as women who are in love with Draco Malfoy. Like, can you just explain it to yourself real quick? <laughs> so I don't have to. <laughs> I <laughs> once upon a time daddy issues were invented yeah once upon a time uh Nick Carter made you believe that blonde men were the the end of the world and like the, for me. oh my god <laughs> the fact that I know exactly who that is <laughs> yes and I'm talking about now and then and I'm talking about him running in a towel and pausing oh, it yeah. to see if you could see his wiener yeah good times yeah good times and of course now I'm more attractive attracted to adam driver than i am to blonde men mm-hmm. but like it's it's just well, and it's you write great. raylo also yeah so um so it's just so funny so yeah that like the comments that come in that are that are negative i get pl- i get nasty comments of course but i actually don't get that much um get get as much as other like i know i know sen gets oh, so yeah. much hate um sen wrote a very controversial and dark fic and she was brave yes she was brave to take a step that way and so a lot of people come back and fight her on it um so i don't get nearly as much hate um as other authors in the fandom but i also think i also think i continue to cultivate like gratitude culture yeah like i try to respond to everything um, anything that's not a direct comment on the fic, which is great. <laughs> like on fan fiction websites, you can leave reviews and comments yeah. and then like you can go through and reply to them. And that's the only place I don't interact with people. Yeah. I think that's fine. I don't know. You have to have your, your boundaries and your limits and like, yeah. Um, man. And yeah, manacled sends, I, mm-hmm. I mean, I really, I really love uh, all you want, but um, yeah, right. Manacled is the first dark thing I ever read, and I, I would have to like take breaks because I would have anxiety attacks mm-hmm. when I reading it. Yeah, um, which is how I understood trigger warnings. After that, I was like, <laughs> oh, I get it. I'm yeah. still gonna read it. Like exactly. I see trigger warning. Hey, I'm like, I've been warned. Yeah, <laughs> I want to do this to myself right now, but I can't yeah. even watch like Walking Dead without having a panic attack. So I, I. Yeah. I'm very sensitive, but I got my, I got through manacles. I got through it. Yeah. And it was good. And that could also be a movie, but um, while we're still on this topic, cause I want to, I want to like touch on your novel, your original. Yeah. Um, let's see. M, my editor. Hi, said, M. <laughs> <laughs> what was the longest hiatus you took from a fic? And do you usually write the whole thing out first and post it on a schedule or do you write and then post later? And which method do you prefer more? I have never, written it fully and then posted um which is now the boundary i've set for myself that's great yeah uh 
w- uh, uh, of new works because I have two works in progress, two or three works in progress that is that are kind of like update as I go, like when the muse strikes. But they've oh yeah, they've good, good and birthright That's and right. um all right as well. The little drabble all right post that that'll never be complete. Like I'll continue writing little like drabble it ha- up happily ever after, you mm-hmm. know. Um, but. My next big um, fic project, I'm doing a You've Got Mail version of Dramione, Dramione version of You've Got Mail. Yeah. Um, and I'm really excited for it. And, um, and of course, I'm not the first person to do it, but I think I am doing it uh, differently. Mm. Um, I think I have an idea that's different. Um, and of course, that wouldn't stop me if some if someone else had done it, I would probably reach out to them and and read, you know, I'd probably not make it weird that like a, a big fandom name is doing yeah. the exact same thing as you. Um, but uh, I am doing it differently. So, but I've told Mar, my um, beta, that we are going to, I'm going to have it completely written and completely betaed before we post. And that then it's just really going to be, nice. doesn't that sound fucking wonderful? That's so nice. I'm not there yet. <laughs> I will be one day. I still yeah. like the idea of, um, well, no, I don't know. This Hermione POV is not going up as I'm doing it. So maybe this is my first one that I actually, I did a one yeah. shot that I fully, fully wrote over the course of a whole month. And yeah. it was like 10,000 words and then put it up. Uh, yeah. It's stressful. It's actually like, it's weirdly more pressure. Yeah. Me. Yeah. Because at least if you're throwing it up there and getting weekly feedback, you could always like I don't yeah. know. It's sort of like I did the paper the day the day it was due or something versus mm-hmm. here's something I worked on for a really long time. It yeah. is that that's just true. Energy. No, that's true. It's very I mean, for me, um I have like I was saying, I have so many different platforms that people can find me on. And I say that like they're shocking me, but um so many different platforms to interact on, and every single one of them become when is the next update for this. So I cannot escape. Yeah, that's a lot the, of, I mean, I get like one comment like that and it throws <laughs> me off. I can't imagine getting the number that you get. Yeah. Um, and uh, my my life coach, Anna, um, is, you know, encouraging me to turn that into, they are excited for you. They well, are not, yeah. they are not demanding something from you, it but sounds, also sometimes it sounds very demanding. Exactly. But, but also turn that shit off if you don't like it. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, so it's that balance of like, I love seeing things in my inbox, but if it's the wrong thing, then I go. Meh. Yeah, totally. It, and yeah. Then if it doesn't help your creative process, exactly. Then get rid of it. Okay. So, so that was, um, um, and then this is Sarah, another boop. The group said uh what does she think of fanfics as a form of literature and will it ever be taken seriously that's so tough i actually just there's a um high school senior that just reached out to me for her capstone um project doing it on fan fiction and like asked that exact same question like i'm trying to argue that it's a form that's a um a form of literary medium you know um and i think I, I mean, I think the main problem is that um, it's primary, you know, there's a lot of um, w- women's gaze and uh, written by women for women in fan fiction. So uh, society will always tell us that it is bad and lesser. Um, and rom-coms will always be fluffy and unnecessary right. where World War I movies can be made uh, four times a year. Right. Um, so comes down to that, but also I think, I think it's tough. I think, um, I would argue that fan fiction is its own literary medium and just, just like how, like, I don't read Stephen King novels. I don't read horror. I don't watch horror. I'm not interested in it because I scared, um, (laughs) but it there's an entire culture and society that love it and read it and contribute to it. Yeah. And that's this, that's what fan fiction has Yeah, right now. So I would argue that it does exist. It just, um, it can't exist for profit. Yeah. So it rides an interesting line of, does that mean it's not 
literature and like it it is because it exists and and there's so, plenty of people i mean uh, all of you blake comes to mind um mm-hmm. who writes has a bunch of novels and also is yeah. extraordinarily prolific i just i'm reading one oh of her fix i mean there's so many to choose from and they're all so fucking well written like yeah I get real bad. I get real bad reading her stuff. But um, she, if you want to get madder, um, my friend Kat has a podcast um, that Olivi and uh, and little Kimura uh, appeared on together about collaboration. Well, you, know, you told me this already, and I listened. Yeah, yeah. and she, yeah, she <clears throat> talks about her process, and you're like, no, go lay down and take a nap like me. <laughs> no, stop writing. <laughs> right. be like, whoops. Uh, uh, 10,000 extra words in this chapter yeah and I was like st- it's, stop it it's not fluff either it's like no. it's really good like yeah. it's ballsy it's all it's always like yeah. wow you really went out on a limb there and that worked and yeah. wow like how do you write all these AUs and I, I'm just like fascinated by her but like yeah. you know she's got some published novels and yeah. you're working on one I am indeed um I took uh, so I write, I also write Star Wars fan fiction for uh, Raylo. Um, and the, I wrote a story, basically I went to see the New York Pops uh, Christmas concert in 2018. And I was staring at the first violinist and the first cellist who have to stare at each other through the entire concert. And I was like, wouldn't it be great if they fucking hated each other. (laughs) Um, And I used the Star Wars characters to create that. And so it was a Star Wars fan fiction. It just takes place here, not in a galaxy far, far away. We Mm -hmm. call that modern AU in fan fiction world. And that's the food of love. Yeah. So the food of love, um, I took it down. It is available for you to, for me to email the PDF. Um, But I took it down um and I started so it it was really well received that's the thing when I was thinking about like what do I want to say to people about on Michelle's podcast um (laughs) what what kind of message do I want to leave um I feel like a lot of times we're told like write your first book and throw it away you know and like hey the first thing you do isn't going to be good and Generation Me was my first musical Mm-hmm. The right thing to do is my first fan fiction, mm-hmm. and the food of love was my first Star Wars fan fiction. Yeah, and there's there's luck and pixie dust involved in everything, um, but sometimes if you really want to do it, you can do it. Yeah. Um, so I wrote a Raylo fan fiction, and it was honestly part of it was like I really want to get the attention of ever so Raylo, who is my favorite Raylo writer. (laughs) And she and I chat every day now. We are so close friends. She is one of the biggest supporters of my work. Um, She finally read the auction because she doesn't like Dramione, but she read it and she was like, now she like screams at me about pumpkin soup and just things like that so that was like you know and having and going to sleep in boxers and and or trunks and socks. boxers trunks and socks like yeah you it, sleeping with socks on you know it's a whole <laughs> like, randomly throwing in a scene where draco gets up and has socks on and then everyone freaked out i did it was rough i like didn't think about the fact that like people think it's weird to sleep in socks because i do sometimes so i wrote that like he woke up and was in a room and he was only in his boxers and socks and people like were like, normal. he was what? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'm sorry. Did you not notice like the poisoning going on or like yeah, the first time she really seen him intense. shirtless? So, like, no, yeah, no. no. My, my favorite thing was that someone in the Facebook group's husband read yeah. uh, read the yeah. thing and live posted all of his reactions. <laughs> and he gets to that part. He goes, socks to bed. Hmm? And I was like, oh my God, you have no idea what you just did. Just writing. Like we're all, everyone's reading this and and you have no idea the controversy that started over the yeah. socks. But there's gonna- a whole pro sock community that supports yeah. me and my decisions. <laughs> I support um, you, you know? yeah. <laughs> so 
so anyways, I wrote the food of love. It was, you know, it was one of the first fics I've written that was actually the length of a novel because usually I write fics that are two or three times the length of a, of a novel. Um, so I always kind of knew I was like, I could transfer this like that would require taking it down, making it no longer available to people that would require so much. So that would require so much work. Um, and it wasn't until I started working with a life coach that, you know, started moving towards that direction and like people will support you and tell the readers where the story's going and maybe some of them will buy it. Um, so I started finally querying that book, which is the process of trying to get it traditionally published. So you have to find an agent first. So I finally started querying it to agents um, just last month. Uh, and that's been a whole new level of hell. Wow. Because <laughs> it's like, you know, rejection emails come in whenever they want to, like right. Saturdays. Right. So you're just like, you're like, where's your nine to five? Come on. Um <laughs> And, uh, but you know, I have a good, I have a good record. I have a good percentage right now of rejections to positive responses. So, um, so hopefully that's, you know, that's the next step for it. But, um, and then I'm currently working on a YA thriller, young adult thriller. So that's the, that's what I'm muddling through right now. Is that the one I'm reading? Yes. <laughs> Michelle's fun because like I'm writing about a popular group and I think Michelle has made it clear to me that she under no circumstances will she like a popular group so she will be my test reader for a long time I'm I, I like fully know that the next time I send you a draft I'm basically my main question is tell me what you don't like <laughs> Tell me why you hate this person. I've read a bunch and I'm just, I, one of my comments was, am I supposed to like these people? I, I, and I was like, oh no. <laughs> like I'm genuinely asking because I only really like the protagonist. Yeah. Um, well, like, hey. why, is she, why is she friends with them? Oh, she like fell in with the wrong crew. I know that poor girl. Yeah. Let's I save really her. Yeah. We got to save her. I'm, I'm on board to like them. I just, uh, you know, I'm like, okay, so they're the assholes at school. Great. So I'm not great. Going. Great. I just yeah. decided immediately. We'll see I know. what we we'll do with it. I'm totally gonna like I I've been meaning to talk to you. I like want to know. I'm like, okay, what <laughs> what popular characters have you liked in the past? Have you ever liked Blair Waldorf? Have you ever liked Nate Archibald? Have you ever liked Regina George? Uh, you know, like which which people have you grown to love? Like tell tell me where your brain is at so I know what to expect mm -hmm. from you <laughs> as yeah, a reader. We'll, we'll talk more about that. Yeah. Yeah. Like but it's that. so great because like, you know, I'm, do, I'm, I'm playing with like the popular click and it, 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 um, dismantling and evaporating and, you know, and that type of thing, but you still have to like them. Yeah. And Michelle doesn't. And I'm like, this is such good feedback <laughs> <laughs> because I would like you to like them. <laughs> I think when I was writing my feedback, I'm like, what's the most important thing I can say to her? Yeah. Oh, mm. Okay. I'll say it. Yeah. Like, what are you asking me? You're not yeah. asking me because you want me to be like, great job. I know. Well, in Break Up With Your Bullshit Live, which was an exciting and excellent event that I attended there. last weekend. Yes. Um, we talked about feedback and you had such amazing things to say about baby feedback and teenage feedback. And I wrote it all down Good. and I was like, this is exactly like I send things to people way too early and Certain people I know for a fact I'm sending it to them because I want a pat on the back. Yeah. And other people I want like red, red ink. Yeah. But sometimes when I get that red ink back, I'm like, this wasn't ready. I didn't, I didn't want this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so we got to wrap soon, but I have two mm -hmm. questions we could do lightning round with. Um, uh, first is what's the bullshit that you're still on? Uh, I still have like fear of the work not being good enough. Um, fan fiction is a little easier because I know that 
I know that there's always a safety net. There will always be people who are excited to read. Um, but the fear that what I'm doing in traditional publishing isn't marketable, mm. isn't at a standard. Yeah. Um, so that's hard to kind of like, well, and then that goes into like, I don't really want to write today, you know, <laughs> and, and then that, that, how that affects productivity is, is the bullshit that I get on in terms of like, like, I can't figure out how to phrase this to make it good. And then I stare at it instead of like, let's write the next chapter. <laughs> yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, and then for anyone listening to this, who's on their bullshit, what advice would you just slap in their face? I would say what I was kind of thinking earlier, just the idea of like, try like something that it doesn't have to be good. It just has to exist. Mm. And like, there are very few things that have to come out of you. Perfect. They have to, you're allowed to have a second draft of things, not just writing, but like writing a song, right? You know, like um, I'm blanking on every medium that isn't singing and writing, but, but, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's even like digital art, especially where you can just be like, delete, delete, delete. Nope, nope, nope. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I think it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to exist. Um is probably is 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 what I'm trying to work on right now. Totally. Mm-hmm. I think that's extremely important because mm-hmm. without action and without like it, it's sort of like when I when I was a video editor um and I was working with this this man that gave me an internship and then shortly after hired me right after college and we were mm-hmm. doing wedding videos and but really stylized cool wedding videos and um and at some point he was he was like just throw it on the timeline. Just throw mm-hmm. It's like, it's like getting the paint out so that you can just get it on the, just start getting it on the canvas because then, then you, then you're creating versus like, let me stare at this footage and think about what I'm going to do with it. No, it doesn't get built like that. And most of the time you start putting on the timeline and then you go, you know what, that entire idea I had wasn't it. And I found something different and you have to like switch in your brain what you're doing. And that happens a lot with fic too, where, you know, you plot it out, but then you're like, ah, yeah, it's not going to go in that direction. And oops, this person died or this happened. It all of a sudden that's happening. And you're like, well, uh, the characters told me to do this instead of the thing I yeah. was in my head, but you're not going to know that stuff until you begin. Yeah. If you don't know the ending of the story, you, it, it, it's less likely that you'll figure it out by staring at it. Yeah. You'll figure it out by writing it. Yeah. I have like, I'm the post-it note queen right now. I'll send you a picture when we're done. But like, I am staring at like two walls full of a ridiculous amount, like a scary amount of post-it notes that like all mean different things and like correspond to like weekly tasks. And like that, you know, I was like, if if, if my brain can get organized, then maybe so oh can God. I. <laughs> it's like Hermione's serial killer wall. It it's is. It looks too. It looks exactly like a serial killer. <laughs> My victims are lined up and waiting. There is a scene you wrote where she is in her robe with one sock on, uh-huh. like, and Harry or one of them walks in. She hasn't showered, and she's just trying to. Figure she's out- holding chopsticks too, yes. like she's like oh, half eating. You know, there's a Chinese food situation, yeah, um, and she's just like, put it over there, you know, like, yeah. I'm at my wall trying to figure out what Draco Malfoy's intentions with me are. That's exactly. She's so upset by the fact that he won't <laughs> speak his mind that she has to like put up a timeline in a serial killer wall in order Why to figure out. Nice to me? Why did he say this to me? Then this when did the me? nice start? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when did his father come into the picture? <laughs> what did he say to me? What did he say to Draco? Draco went to see him on this day. Seriously, yeah. oh, it's a really good story. Uh, it will it will probably convert you into liking this um, this genre. And yeah. I, I think there's a lot of works out there that will do the exact opposite, or you know, like won't yeah. really bring you in, or because they don't give enough foundation to why this is happening. And it's just like, well, 
I can't even read stuff like that now. If it just starts and it's yeah. like, hey, Granger, first time I've seen you since uh, the Battle of Hogwarts <laughs> and they're making out. I'm like, mm, 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 mm. there's got to be some sort of redemption. Something I know. Happens. It's well, and it's so funny you said that because like that's the biggest problem with transitioning from fic to original is that like, you know, if you were to take a Dramione fanfic and try to turn it into a novel, think of all the work you would have to do to create your version of Hogwarts. And like, they hated each other at school. And why was that without him being racist? Yeah. You know, like, and like, how do you like a character who has racist yeah. tendency, racist coded tendencies? Right. Um, and that's been that's been the biggest lesson that I'm playing with right now. And I'm only writing, you know, Star Wars to original right. <laughs> <laughs> where I'm, just, pe- you know, like people who read it who don't know it's a fic. They're like, why are you spending so time so much time on this mom? And I'm like, because that's Leia Organa. OK, it's very important. <laughs> it's really important. And her brother is even more important in his eyes. So, like, I have to, like, get that on the page. <laughs> totally, totally. Oh, man, I could talk to you for hours, but we <laughs> we must complete now. Fine. Fine. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for being here and talking to us all about your writing process. I learned a lot of things, and I think this will be super valuable to a lot of people. So. Thank you. Thank I'm, you so I was much. honored to be, I was honored to be thought of as someone who had broken up with her bullshit. Uh, girl, <laughs> you got an eight awards uh, and uh, <laughs> you got thousands of people watching your shit. Yeah. I um, see yeah, something's there. Yeah. There's something there. Yeah. I think you got something, kid. I think you're gonna be a star. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Ming. Break up with your